just uh, on behalf of the Maine Masonic College, I'm happy everybody's here. Now, uh, just a quick preamble about uh, the Maine Masonic College. Uh, we do offer at least two courses a month, uh, every month of the year. Uh, so in an ideal schedule, you'll have uh, the opportunity to, to catch any of these classes, whether they're local or now online. Uh, the website is tobringmorelight.org. And uh, you can also get to it through the uh, Grand Lodge website, which just has a page for the Maine Masonic College. Welcome, everybody. I'm really happy that everyone's here today. And I'm going to hand the floor over to, uh, to George and, and uh, Donald and, you know, enjoy today's class. So thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm George MacDougall. And uh, on my screen, the fella to my uh, left over here is Don MacDougall. And he's going to do the second half of the class. I'm going to start us off. And what we uh, normally do that is going to be a little bit different today uh, today is I usually have a bunch of books out on a, a desk for people to walk around during the coffee lot, coffee time to uh, to look at. And I noticed no one was hanging around my desk looking at them. So I'm just going to give a quick overview to those because we have a lot of material to go through in the next two hours. Um, the first book is called Thinking Fast and Slow, and it's by Daniel Kahneman. And it was, uh, it was written in 2011. It's, a, it's an excellent book. It's fairly thick. I don't have it to show it to you because I loaned it to somebody at work. They have since retired and they didn't bother to give it back to me. So I'm guessing I'm not going to get that back. But uh, Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And it covers a whole lifetime of his research that he does with an Amos Tversky. And Amos is a cognitive uh, psychologist. So the book covers cognitive biases. Uh, system one, which is the fast thinking, is instinct and emotional, or your gut feelings, and when those should be used and when they shouldn't be used, based on a lot of research. And system two is the deliberate or deliberative, logical, kind of the reasoning thinking, the kind of reason, the kind of thinking that probably should be pr uh, pretty predominant in your lifetime. The next book is called The Drunkard's Walk. And it's not about, you know, the best martini bars in Brooklyn. It's actually a statistical term. The Drunkard's Walk is all about randomness. And what's fascinating about this book is randomness is a really big part of life. A lot of people think they can predict things, but they only get lucky because the things have so many different factors in them that they're random. So we're gonna talk a little more about what you do when things are random later on. Another good book on thinking is Decisive. And I think this one has the great, great sentence in the beginning. Its research in psychology has revealed that our decisions are disrupted by an array of biases and irrationalities. And we're gonna cover some of those also in the next two hours. Another thing that affects critical thinking is habit and the habit cycle. So here's a book on how to break the habit cycle, how to make changes. And these are all just full of stories about things that happened that how they turned out, how they could have turned out. And then lastly, it seems kind of like a joke, but part of critical thinking is logic. And the best way to really hone your logic skills is to do puzzles. So here's just the one that has uh, all kinds of puzzles in it. It's funny because there's actually like, oh, I don't know, maybe five to 10 different types of puzzles that you see so once you learn the, how to how they work, you can actually solve a lot of puzzles within the genre. You know, puzzles where you're measuring out liquids in different containers, but you don't exactly have enough containers to do what you think you need to do. But in essence, you do. So we'll do some of that stuff as well. All right, I'm gonna attempt to share up my screen. And unfortunately, the way I do it with my two screens is I'll, I won't be able to see you anymore. But let's see here. So if you do have a question, I won't be able to see you wave your hand. All right, I knew, I knew which one I wanted to share up. All 
Okay, so is everyone seeing a nice blue picture of a man thinking? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Indeed. There we go, right here, all right. So I was gonna learn some way to put that as my background, but I knew if I held up a book while I was doing a background, it wouldn't show for some reason. It's, it's very picky the way it picks things up. So to begin with, and I, I'm not gonna be able to see hands going up, so you'll all have to shout out here, is the definition of critical. So involving or characteristic of critics or criticism or another definition is urgently needed, absolutely necessary. What definition of critical do you think we're gonna be talking about when it comes to critical thinking today? I'm gonna guess the first one maybe. First one, anyone think maybe the second one? Well, I would say uh, absolutely necessary is a, a good qualifying thing for when we're talking about definitely critical thinking or uh, you know being able to step outside and, and do some analysis okay I know we got John Jeffers has his hand raised yeah um, I'm thinking that uh, involving or characteristic of critics or criticism is uh, one of those things that actually creates this uh, reaction in people and sometimes looking at that is uh, uh, and, and, and staying out of that uh, automaticity part of our mind is important. Yeah, no, excellent points. Actually, all three were excellent points because I don't think there is a wrong answer here. You know, I think technically critical thinking is the one that you uh, involve criticism and critics, and yet critical thinking is ultimately needed and absolutely necessary. So I think both of those fit right into that. So perfect, that's exactly right. So to get us going here, I thought it'd be, you know, we'd start off a little easy, not hit the hard stuff right away. So we got some quotes here. So the learned are well prepared for the world that no longer exists while the learners are preparing for the world of the future. So what's that saying is, you know, you can go to school and you can learn the subject. Well, I'm an engineer. So let's say I, I went to school, I learned engineering and Survey, let's say survey, that's a great example. I can go out with a, a rod and I can go out with a level and I can survey right out of school to beat the band. Well, that was 34 years ago. How much good is that gonna do me today, do you think? Well, not very much. I mean, I could probably still hack out a little bit of a living if I was a surveyor, but I would have had to keep up with what was happening. And in the survey world, computers came in like a storm. And what used to have to take a level and a rod and then go home and you know crunch the numbers and figure out elevations and distances can all be done now in one instrument the second the surveyor hits the button. It's using satellites. So if I'm learned, I'm learned, it's, that's great at first, but it's going to be the half-life of learning disappears quickly. I have to keep learning in order to keep up with the world of the future. So moral excellence comes about as a result of habit. We become just by doing just acts, temperate by doing temperate acts, brave by doing brave acts. And that is a quote from Aristotle. And Aristotle was a virtue ethicist. And that virtue ethicists discuss the nature and definition of virtues and other related problems, which focuses on the consequences of action. So they believed that you were what you were based on what you did. And the opposite of that are people who argue that you do what you do because of what you are. So just a little, little quote there to get us thinking. Oh, let's see. get us kind of thinking, you know, on chicken and the egg type of deal. What came first? Is there really an answer for something like that? And then here's a great one I like here from Keynes. The difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as escaping from the old ones. And 
does that resonate with you guys out there? Yeah. I mean, you get something in your mind and darn it, that's got to work. It just makes so much sense. I'm going to keep going with that. And that is the death of critical thinking. When you get something already in your head and you just keep going right on. And this is another one I like too, and I don't know who S. Johnson is, but he's nailed it here. The chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. You know, that's where that habit book comes in. That's when you attack those things. You know, that's almost like saying, well, this is the way we've always done it. And we're just going to keep right on going. Then if, if you don't know what harbor you're making for, then no wind is the right wind. And that's from a gentleman named Seneca the Younger. Now I'm thinking he might be kind of cynical because this probably strikes you as maybe the Wizard of Oz when the scarecrow is, they first come across the scarecrow at the crossroads and they say, well, how do we go? Which way do we go? And he goes, well, where do you want to go? And they say, well, we don't know. And he goes, well, then I guess either road is good for you. So you, you got to have a plan. You got to have a plan. And my favorite author of ever is uh, Agatha Christie. And I read her books over and over again, at least every year. And I, I got to put a plug in. If, if you have a book you read maybe as a kid or 20 years ago, and you thought it was good, but it was a kid's book or something, go back and read it again. Because you've had 20 years of uh, wisdom and knowledge that changes your whole focus of how you look at things. So if you read those books again, you'll be surprised at uh, what you can pick out. Now, a good example, because besides reading Agatha Christie, I read Tolkien about every two years too. And if you go back and read J.R. Tolkien, you'll be picking up things that you completely missed as a kid that he wrote about into those books. Um, but Hercule Poirot, he's, he's one of Agatha Christie's chief detectives. And he is like the superb critical thinker. I, uh, I go through those books now and I actually have three pages of quotes from the different detectives that, that just, it just, emphasize critical thinking. And here's one where poor Hastings is his um, assistant who works with him. And he goes, my goodness, Hastings, it amazes me at how fast you jump to your conclusions. Because Hastings is a gut thinker. He sees something and he knows exactly what's going on. Whereas Perot, he, uh, he likes to kind of reason through it before he comes up and tells you what's going on. That also helps keep the book going all the way to the end. But it is part of critical thinking. Remember, he's Belgian. He's not French. That's right. <laughs> and he'll mention that in just about every book. <laughs> Another fan. So then you got to be careful because things that sound like quotes might not really be real. I mean, big surprise there, right? So you have to respect Abe Lincoln. He was born in a log cabin that he made with his own two hands. I mean, that is a pretty amazing guy. Am I right? Anyone see anything that might be a little bit tricky on that one? Yeah, I mean, he, he obviously didn't make his own birthplace by his own two hands, right? But people will throw these things out there. And that brings us right up. Oh, that'll bring us to another quote here pretty soon. Now that a lot of books I read are fantasy books, so I had to come up with a sort of truth here and give you wizard's first rule. There's like 12 of them. But the first rule pretty much kind of lays out a cynical view of what's probably true. But people are stupid. Given proper motivation, almost anyone will believe almost anything. Because people are stupid, they will believe a lie because they want to believe it's true or they're afraid that it might be true. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Now, the rule keeps going to say that people's heads are just full of knowledge, facts, and beliefs, but most of it's false. Yet, they think it's all true. And you have to be careful of that because people are stupid. They can rarely tell the difference between a lie and the truth. And yet they are confident they can. And so are all the easier to fool. So if you can get someone going into their gut thinking, you can pretty much lead them anywhere you want. Get them emotional, 
you can trick them. And that's what they teach wizards, I guess, in the uh, days of yore. I don't know if wizards have become marketers or how that works now. But. And this is actually a recent quote that I found. I mean, it obviously wasn't recently said, but uh, JFK addressing Yale University. And I was hoping my brother was gonna be on so I could really emphasize Yale University because he went to uh, that other institute in Boston there, Harvard. But the, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, the deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebearers. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion <clears throat> without the discomfort of thought. So that's got a lot of stuff in it right there. I mean, first of all, beware. People could be telling you what they think is the God's honest truth, and it could be completely false because they didn't do any checking on it. They just heard it, and they go running with it. The other thing that's really cool there, and the last of it, is that they enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Because it hurt, it's hard to think, right? If you are, aren't used to it, it's like doing bench presses or it's like doing uh, push-ups or something. It's not easy to do at first. It takes a while. You got to work on your brain and make it uh, in shape. So without the discomfort of thought, it's just easier to take what people give you and run with it. All right, so we could go on with on quotes for quite a long time, but we're gonna get right into it now. And I have to apologize. I'm using old pair of glasses here and I've wrote, I wrote on my notes on, it has a black background with a black pen. That was not very clever, but. So critical thinking defined. Critical thinking is a habit of mind that questions <coughs> certain assumptions methods, conclusions, values, principles, rules, or evidence concerning an issue or a problem. Or critical thinking can also be a self-discipline of mind that thoughtfully follows reason and evidence with an open mind in pursuit of the truth, ability to change directions when new evidence is presented. So what's key here is to change directions when new evidence is presented instead of just throwing that new evidence out. Because, you know, you're focused, you got a thought, you got a conclusion, and now anything that doesn't fit that is gonna get thrown out. You can't do that. A set of skills that give appropriate consideration to observable evidence allows for seasoned judgment and requires full appreciation of the problem. A mental process that faces problems with integrity prioritizes issues, gathers and interprets evidence, is aware of assumptions, draws conclusions, exercises judgment, and tests the conclusions. So integrity is a pretty strong word. And I know a, a lady who used to work for me had a, a plaque on the wall of her cubicle that said, once integrity goes, nothing else matters. So that's a key word in that definition right there. And you'll notice all the definitions use evidence. You can't just do it off the top of your head. You need to gather evidence. And it's a mental process that takes fortitude to use a Masonic term, um, a set of skills that's really talking almost like wisdom to gather evidence through experience. And I think at this point, you know, where it says a habit of mind in the first definition, I wanna tell you why I got into critical thinking because I was not a critical thinker. I don't know if I am now, but um, I like to think I am after doing these classes probably for like 20 times and attending about 15 before that. But when I was in, oh, bridge, doing bridge design and I was getting an evaluation from my supervisor one of the comments she made was, well, you tend to believe everything people tell you. 
And then, you know, at the time I thought, well, that's right. That's a good thing, right? And I guess it wasn't a good thing because uh, like I said, not everything people tell you is true. So that was one thing that clued me in that I needed to make a change. And currently I'm the um, contracts engineer for the Department of Transportation. And when they gave me that position, there was a, a question going <coughs> that said, well, I don't know. Um, George tends to uh, you know, believe what people tell him. So th that was kind of a downside of being the contracts engineer, I guess. And that my old boss, who the, the person said that to, who uh, had the chair before me said, oh, don't worry, that won't last very long. So, <laughs> so I thought, you know, what? I'm, I'm gonna run with critical thinking. And I, uh, I took it actually as a journey through the college and we probably don't have a lot of time to talk about that program, but if you do have questions at the end, we do have Luke Shorty here, who's our Dean, and he can answer questions on that. But I do have a diploma in critical thinking now. So I guess I'm like, um, uh, who is it? Was it the Tin Man? No, they gave him a watch. Who was it? They gave someone a diploma and all of a sudden he was smart. It was a lion, I think, in The Wizard of Oz, right? The Scarecrow. Oh, the Scarecrow, okay. The Scarecrow needed brains. That's right. Because he just had straw in his head. So, so I have a diploma, so I'm smart like the Scarecrow here. Okay, applying critical thinking. So typically it's employed in decision-making, problem solving, or judging. Really valuable in everyday life. And that, that's exactly right. You wouldn't believe how often, once it becomes aware to you, how often you're gonna use it. Skills include objective observation. So not just seeing it, you actually are studying what you're looking at. Criteria used in deciding, self-correcting, focus questioning, establishing context, context, risk analysis, and use of theoretical constructs. Involves intellectual traits of mind, such as fairness, integrity, there's integrity again, and courage, courage to keep going. Avoids the egocentric thinking of I or we believe, I want to believe, I have always believed, and it is in my interest to believe. <clears throat> that leads to two sayings that I've always disliked, and they really shut down progress, not just critical thinking, but any kind of progress. And the first is, you know, we've always done it that way. And I know everyone here has heard that one, because you're, you're a member of a lodge, for one thing. Um, the other one that I hate even worse than that is, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, that kind of shuts down improving anything that might be just barely working, but something changed and now we need to change this process as well. But people go, oh, it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. All right, and then another application of critical thinking is includes a set of values such as questioning traditional institutions, customs, beliefs, processes, challenges authority, applying evidence, and uses a scientific method. So I thought, oh geez, after reading scientific method, I better come up with something here. So this is what I found on the scientific method for critical thinking terms. And it's really kind of a circular thinking and it starts anywhere you wanna start and then moves clockwise. Uh, I guess that's a term that you kind of have to start to define, isn't it? Because people aren't going to know what clockwise is here pretty soon. But, you know, you analyze. Let's start there with a little detective there. He's analyzing. Then he's reasoning what he's looked at. Then he's kind of evaluating it, sifting through it. And well, maybe we should have started with problem solving. But he's kind of problem solving from what he's seen, what the problem is. And then it's decision making. And maybe he sees more evidence. So then he starts analyzing again. Even though he's come to a conclusion, he doesn't just throw out anything that doesn't fit that. Now, a critical thinker uses questions as the basis of action. And 
sometimes it's defined as the 10 whys, because if you start with why and just keep asking why, yeah, you're kind of annoying there after a while, but it really digs down deep into the, the subject. You know, like if I say, use this questions as a basis of action, you could say, why? I go, well, because you need to find you know, information. And you could say, why? And I could say, well, you need information in order to form some kind of thesis, some kind of basis. And you could keep saying, why? Eventually, I'm going to run out of uh, answers. But you really, whys really bring up a lot of information. So again, you know, using questions as a basis of action, not just jumping to conclusions as poor Hastings likes to do. So under, and a critical thinker understands the different norms and rules of different contexts and acts accordingly. So you can, you can see something one way, and then like I said, 20 years later, you can see it a whole different way, or 10 minutes later, you can see it a whole different way. That's context. So, so like if a, a panda walks into a bar, a panda bear, a panda walks into a bar, eats, shoots, and leaves. Well, that's context. How many people thought the panda came in, had some dinner, and then shot somebody before he left? Yeah, you know, so there you go. Luke's before, yeah, Luke's being good to me. He's raising his hand. If I had put a gun up before I said that, I bet about 90% of the people would have thought that's what he did. So it's all in the context. Now that expression is really a, punctu a punctuation exercise, but I like to use it here in the context. It shows that things can be taken two ways. And if you're talking to someone and giving them information, you wanna remember they might be taking it a whole different way than you're taking it. And actually um, some of our ritual can be done that way too. You have to be careful how someone has, you know, a different take on their life than you do and you're telling them something in the ritual and they're like totally taking it a different way. Like Don has a great presentation on the a letter G lecture. And when we get to numerous worlds or around us, I always think of the planets and solar systems. but he has this picture of a drop of water and all the little organisms that live inside the uh, drop of water. So there's ways to look at things. Uh, a critical thinker tolerates ambiguity. And this took me for a long, long time to understand. And you know what? Just yesterday when I was going over these slides, that hit me what that meant. Ambiguity, of course, is keeping things vague, keeping things open. So if you're a critical thinker and early in the situation, you say, this is what it is. I know it. Well, now you've just closed your mind and you've closed yourself to taking in any new information or gathering any new evidence. So a critical thinker has to tolerate ambiguity. He has to keep open to all possibilities until he's locked down exactly what's going to be the answer. Critical thinker tends toward alternative ways of thinking and acting without a crisis or trauma forcing him or her to do so. So that sounds pretty easy to think of, right? But what it is, is if you, um, oh, say you're a, a manufacturer and you used to make watches out of crystals. You know, I mean, you used to make watches out of gears and, you know, like the Swiss and you got a really good reputation of it and someone comes along or you even come along and you think, hey, if I use crystals of quartz that vibrate, I can make cheaper watches. That's great. I'm going to do this. And you just keep on going. Well, there comes a point where everything is going really well, but you got to start doing research because it's an S curve. It starts out slow until people catch on to what you got. Then they love it, right? Maybe even a better example is a cell phone, actually. I'm going to go with a cell phone. So you invent a better cell phone, and it starts out kind of slow, but people start buying it. They love it. It goes up. Sales are going crazy. And you think, I'm going to ride this baby to the end of my retirement. Well, someone else comes up maybe with something better. So what you need to do before that happens is you need to come up with something better before you start to level off. And then your S-curve just keeps going up and up. So that's saying it tends to, uh, to do something before you have to do something. And critical thinking also challenges group think. And 
the, uh, the, 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 the classic example there is right in the word challenges because the challenger is an example of group thing. And of course the, the challenger was the, the space shuttle that exploded back in uh, 85, 86. And it's, uh, it was a tragedy in itself, but it was even more of a tragedy because uh, they had taken a school teacher up to go to the space station when it exploded. And what happened there is, you know, you had a whole bunch of people at the engineering firm saying, we have evidence that shows that this is an iffy thing, we should not launch. And of course you got a whole group of government that hired those people saying, we want to get the school teacher up there and we want to be the first ones to do it. So there was a lot of pressure on that, a lot of group think going on. And they finally gave in and they launched and the, the shuttle blew up. So group think is not always right. Democracy is not always the way to uh, get to the right answer sometimes. We, uh, a critical thinker is gonna question the standard, the accepted or the right solution to problems because it might not be the right solution. A critical thinker does not blame, but seeks information. Uh, a lot of people at work like to point fingers, but you know, that doesn't get you bridge built and out there for people to use. It just clears you of, I guess, making a mistake. But the whole, the whole problem is to get that bridge out and done, no matter who makes a mistake, the team works together to get it out. George? Uh, yeah. Quick, just a quick comment here. There's some, some good dialogue happening in the chat window about, um, about groupthink and authority. Like, you know, someone asked the question, I think it was, it was Brian and Malou who were saying like, you know, why is the sky blue? And then your parents says, cause I say it is, you know, yeah. Uh, a real side discussion about authority. And I think, uh, the important thing to, to realize when trying to, uh, implement critical thinking is to make sure that um, that the group and the group think and that the authority that that is is going in a certain direction stay at the table and I think that may be a good uh, time at some point if we offered a rhetoric class to talk about how to make sure that your rhetoric is in such a way that it keeps people open to the discussion so that the critical thinking skills can be used in order to uh, help the group as a whole see things in a more accurate and critical light. I just wanted to add that commentary uh, in there. Excellent, what I was seeing excellent point. Uh, I'm going to have Luke come to all my classes. I like that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Luke. Um, so yeah, and the critical thinker is also exploits organizational strengths, recognizes organizational weaknesses. Now, obviously, I work for a big organization. And I'm sure a lot of you guys do. So we have this thing called best practices. And it's what worked for us really well. And of course, we're a state agency. So we contact all the other state agencies in the United States and say, what worked for you? And we put it all together. And then we have uh, our best practices. Now, fairly recently, we've also started our um, worst practices, things to avoid. So it's kind of a tool to recognize strengths and weaknesses of, a, of critical thinking. So a critical thinker also believes in the, the future is open, flexible, rather than fixed and determined. So therefore, if you think it's determined, then why even bother to just start thinking about ways to solve stuff? Why get deeply in thought about, you know, like Aristotle? It doesn't matter. It's all just going to end this way. So why even bother to think about it? But a critical thinker doesn't think that way. So a critical thinking behavior. So it raises important questions or problems and formulates them clearly and with precision. Kind of what Luke just said. It gets you know, a critical thinker can present their facts in a way that people can understand what they mean. You know, knowing the problem is half the battle, getting those together and getting them clear. A critical thinker gathers relevant information and interprets that information in a reasoned fashion. You know, not just what fits your theory, 
It's all the relevant information. A critical thinker drives toward well-reasoned conclusions and solutions. So it's well-reasoned. It's like our little Belgian. It's not like Hastings, who's jumping to conclusions left and right. He even within a paragraph will change his conclusion to a different one, you know? It's not well-reasoned. A critical thinker thinks and proceeds with an open mind, recognizing that others may have different information or interpret it differently. Again, to Luke's point, that's what, they're, uh, that's what he's getting at right here. You don't, you don't keep things to yourself. You share them with your team. And then the team becomes a lot stronger than the pieces of its parts, you know. Critical thinking behavior also communicates effectively in order to increase the understanding of all parties, balancing understanding other viewpoints with not being duly influenced by others. And, you know, that's, that's what they were kind of getting at when they were talking about me. Someone would say something and it would influence my thinking. So you really have to learn to put a shield up and step back. And when someone says something, kind of say to yourself, well, I wonder where they got that from. And you can even ask me, oh, well, what's that based on? And they'll say, oh, well, I just happened to see it on the internet. It's like, oh, okay. So it's, it's probably completely false. And all right, I got you now. Um, Critical thinking also applies methods of logical inquiry and reasoning. So in short, critical thinking is the triumph of epistemology, which is the science of knowing, versus orthodoxy, which is adhering to accepted, established, or traditional ways. Now, I'm always nervous throwing that out there that I'm going to get in trouble, but you know, sometimes orthodoxy is right. But when it comes to critical thinking, it really doesn't fit in. I think, uh, oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to. No, that. come on. This is a good place for questions if anyone has anything. Yeah, I was just, I was thinking there's something about the tension of orthodoxy and, and critical analysis and thinking that I think is, is important. Um, I had a little note here when you had mentioned cognitive discomfort. Um, I think that tension between orthodoxy and analysis and reflection and pushing back against that orthodoxy creates that cognitive and sometimes emotional discomfort. And I think that is what ultimately leads um, to personal growth if approached appropriately, right? If you, can, right. if you can keep that tension and work your way through it, um, that I think is where innovation and, and, and progress comes. Um, but I just kind of wanted to, to state that, that I think it's okay to have some tension between orthodoxy and critical analysis. If anything, it's a necessary component to the, uh, the development. So that's all. Don't mean to hog the mic. If anybody else wants to hop in, please do. <laughs> no, it goes to the fortitude, right? To stay with it. George, just one little thing on the interjection. For years, I taught earth science, and my students all had to know for standardized tests that there were 12 moons around Jupiter. Well, with our newer technology now, we've up, we're up at, what, 60-some and counting, you know? And yet, that was uh, the, my, my students were expected to know that there were 12 moons on Jupiter. Of course, now, it's nice to know that there used to be. But anyway, <laughs> just that's one place where it needs to be thrown out somehow. <laughs> okay. Well, as long as I can name the 12, I don't think anyone will be listening after that. So, yeah. No, good. Excellent point. Yeah. Hey, hey, George. Yeah. You guys, this is Daryl Lyon from St. Andrews, um, number 83 in Bangor. I'm, I'm curious about the quote that you started the lecture with that said that the learned are well prepared for the world that no longer exists while the learners are preparing for the world of the future. Is it the responsibility of the learned? to teach the learning. And if that's the case, how can I overcome, um, how can I overcome my own biases to what I know from the past 20 years of my career, preparing my students for a future that I don't even know what it's gonna be like. 
and how it's going to exist, especially when we're talking about the soft skills of um, science, or not sciences, but, you know, the rhetoric and uh, communication skills and things like that. I, I teach junior ROTC at Bangor High, and I find that I'm teaching leadership quite frequently, especially in today's times. And I'm, I'm not sure I'm teaching my kids the skills that they're going to need in 2045 and what that's even going to look like. No, that's an excellent point. I mean, um, are there any kind of like uh, academic journals or something or military history? Of course, that's going backwards, but. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of maxims that they throw at these kids. Um, they're all, you know, there's all kinds of, but, but when you start thinking about what the world will look like in 20 years from now and the integration of technology and um, what we're learning about the isolation of our communities based on uh, technology, you know, am I really giving them the skill set that they're going to need in order to be, ex you know, ex exceptional leaders in, in, a, in a time that I can't even comprehend? Yeah, actually, though, thinking about what you said, Daryl, I don't think you could really teach them what 20 years from now is going to be like. But I think if you could teach them, I'm a little familiar with the military history because my uh, father-in-law taught it also at uh, Providence and my brother went through ROTC up at Bangor. Um, you know, you could give them the skills that you think they're going to need for now, because you're not teaching them how they're going to have skills from the Civil War, I, you know. So you're doing the best you can for what they're doing now. I think the point to get across to your students is, this is what works now, but in the future, when someone develops lasers, you're not going to be able to do these tactics. You're going to have to come up with some new tactics, kind of like, just let them know that things are going to change. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, that's the best we can always, do, I think. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. It's, it's the it's the baseline leadership skills that we're, we're going to um, teach. But, you know, the, the the Pentagon is always guilty of, t you know, training for its last war. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, yeah, how, how can you know, how can I prepare that? I mean, when I went through infantry basic course down at Fort Benning, you know, we learned jungle tactics. We learned from the Vietnam veterans who taught who fought in Vietnam. And when I went to Iraq, we weren't in Vietnam. Um, that was a totally different uh, um, atmosphere and, and how we learned and trained and did those things were totally different. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It tends to be reactive more than proactive. That's what I find. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no, that's a good point. Good. George. Did I hear someone else? Yep. Dave Walker. Oh, most worshipful. Oh, just Dave, come on. <laughs> uh, I think to that point, this is ex especially important that critical thinking be taught because while you can't teach for what's going to be 40, 45 years away, you can teach uh, students to be adaptable and open and do critical thinking and not accept what has always been, always will be. And I think that's where this whole topic will lead us. No, that's a great point. Thanks, Dave. Good seeing you too, by the way. It's been a while. I, th I think that applies in masonry too. Yeah, I, I agree. All right, well, this is great discussion and I'm, I apologize because I'm going longer than I intended to. And I know Don's got some great stuff. so. We may end up going longer than the two hours. I don't know here. But uh, here's a study that I used to use as a shock absorber. So if I was going too fast, I'd give people more time to work on it. But I've I kind of adapted it a little differently for today. So here's Tom W. And I was kind of worried that people wouldn't be able to see the slide. Then I remembered, well, you're going to be looking on your computer and see it just as well as I can here. So. So, you know, so please read the following personality sketch for Tom W, who's a high school senior. You know, it was written by a school psychologist who used several psychological tests of uncertain validity to draw these conclusions. So take a quick read here. I'll just give you a minute to just read down through that. In fact, I'm gonna jump on that because it's not really important what you read about Tom W. 
the exercise then said, okay, now rank the following graduate school programs that you think Tom W. would go through. And, you know, it lists them out as business administration, computer science, and all kinds of them. And then it says, okay, once you're done doing that, now rank those, um, those uh, majors based on what you think is the number one major, how many people by the number of people. So if you think most people go into business administration, make that number one. If you think the second most people are gonna go into um, social science and social work, bring that number two. And what do you think the results would be on something like this? Well, the, the trick here is, and my environmental teacher back in school taught me this, people throw a lot of things at you and they expect you to solve a problem. So what he used to do is he used to give us a lot of givens that didn't make any difference to the problem. And we had to sort out what was important. But there's one thing here in the problem statement that makes you realize the whole thing is a pile of uh, falsehoods. And that's because the school psychologists use tests of uncertain validity. So everything the school psychologist tells you about your kid, maybe Tom W is your kid, you know, and he's telling you, hey, based on these tests that don't mean anything, we're gonna send your kid to computer school. So the reason they had you in this problem rank all the, um, the majors by how many people go to them, because when you don't have any anything else to go by, you have to start using statistics. So since you don't know anything about Tom W and if he's your kid, you might've known something about him, but say uh, based on this exercise, you don't know anything about Tom W, the odds are he's gonna go into whatever major you think the most kids go into such as business administration. Any questions on that? Do you, do you see what that's saying? That's saying that in, you know, in life, you're given a lot of uncertainties. You have to re you have to rely on statistics and randomness to to figure it out. You have to throw everything away and just say, "That's eh, most likely he's going to go into business administration." It sounds like you know you're making a guess, but it's your best guess. You don't have anything else to go by. So that's a great one to get people talking, you know, for 15, 20 minutes, and then tell them, "Oh, by the way." everything that you read was no good because it's based on poor testing. Any questions on that? Did I go over that too fast? Because this is a little different way than we ever done it before. Okay, we'll, we'll move on now. All right, so brain interpretations. So I meant to say when we first started that once we get done with this course, you're not going to believe anything you've heard, you're not going to believe anything you read, and you're not going to believe anything you see. And this is the part where you won't believe everything you see. And Don has some more of these later on, but I think we'll go through them together. Well, we, all right, so here's a simple little one. You know, how many triangles do you see? None. None, exactly. You might see two, but then you realize, no, I'm not. I'm seeing a whole bunch of little chevrons and some white space, as well as some Pac-Man eating, trying to get in there and eat them up. And I fell for it again. Oh, John, John, <laughs> one of my favorite students. Ah, no, it's, uh, it, yeah, that's what your brain sees. Then, you know, which line is uh, longer, which line is shorter? Well, what we do in the class is I have a yardstick and I walk up to the screen and I put the yardstick up there and you can see even though it, it looks kind of tough and maybe if you have a ruler, I should have said you should get a ruler right at the beginning. The lines are the same length. It's just the, uh, the way those arrows give you the illusion that one's longer than the other. And uh, as Don, will say, you know, the brain is looking for a pattern. And uh, we're gonna get into some more where that pattern becomes quite obvious. The middle circles, because of what's around them, 
look like different sizes, but those middle circles are the same size. And here's where the yardstick comes in handy because those lines going through the, uh, I guess the Japanese flag, they look like they kind of curve around like almost a gravity, anti-gravity here. But those lines are parallel to each other. Those thick lines are parallel. That's where the yardstick comes in handy as well because your brain sees the curve. But as soon as the yardstick goes up, it's almost like you can see that curve flatten and become uh, flat become parallel. And this one, you would swear that it's a bulge right there. But again, if you put the yardstick up to it, the lines, they go from like this, right down to a parallel. It's almost like you can see them moving in your in your mind as mind's eye as you do that. The brain is just looking for patterns. And then here's an amazing one too, because now your, your brain is putting things in where there's nothing there. You know, if you look at this long enough, you start to see dots in between the apexes of the squares. And if you look at it too long, I mean, I don't know what happens. But. Anything you wanted to say on this one, Don? I know you had some comments on this. No, just wondering how, why our brain puts in those black dots that are jumping all over the place. We can't look at them, but we can see them in our peripheral vision. Uh, I'm just curious about the mechanism within the brain. Nothing. Really. No, that's, it's fascinating stuff. Don's going to cover more on the brain too in the next, in the second half. I, I will say this in my world, this stuff is critical because we try to image to be presented in a film or video and get filled to it. So using mise-en-scene and elements within a given scene and, and composition with framing to create that depth and converging angles and things, all of this stuff uh, helps create a, a third dimension where there really isn't any. That's what early TV was all about, right? <laughs> Putting the giant 10 feet closer to the camera than the Lilliputian. And... That's exactly right. <laughs> Oh, this one works really well in the classroom too, because you won't believe this, but those tabletops are exactly the same shape and size. But what we do in the classroom is we actually cut papers apart and cut out the tables and lay them on top of each other. That's the only way people will believe that. Oh, I bet you can see my cursor over here, can't you? Yeah. So, uh, we can, uh, we can send those to you. If you send us an email, we'll send this presentation and then you can take things apart. The next one, yes, the next one I can never, as, ever see. We have all of these as uh, files so they can be easily emailed if anybody wanted them. <clears throat> so, yeah, no, that can't be true. A and B are the same color? A and B are the same color. Now, Watch this. So we're gonna we gotta we're gonna digitally cut these babies apart, which is always it's like watching magic on TV, right? Because you know they just stopped the camera and then brought Genie out and then they turned the camera back on. So but this is honest to God truth. I just cut it and took another picture of it. But there's A and B. So I'll, now I'll go back to prove it. Now see how A is the same color pretty much of that one. And B is pretty much the same color of that. Now keep your eye on those two things while I pick your pocket. I mean, keep your eye on those two things while I hit the arrow again. And see, A is pretty much still the same color. B is still kind of the same color. But A and B are identical. That's an amazing one. Never see that one coming. Never see that coming. That's all because of the shadow and the, what's around it. Yeah, yeah, you keep doing this, your brain will fry pretty quickly. Yeah. More fortitude. All right, well, we're going to get to some more of those in a little bit. We're going to leave them for now. And we're going to jump in here. And I, I don't know why. 
what the I don't know what's where the skirting in this one, but the skirting on the table. But they had someone who probably that's a mosaic tile or something. But this is the the Da Vinci's uh, Last Supper, and. If you've ever read the other books I like to read are the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. And the Da Vinci Code is kind of based on conspiracy theories. And one of them is that Jesus actually got married and had a whole line of kids and a whole lineage of family. And, you know, they have to reunite his uh, current modern ancestors with all kinds of stuff through the whole book. And one of the things I use to base that is this uh, Last Supper where it's you know depicting Christ with his disciples. But is it? And that's where the thought, the conspiracy comes in because if you look here, you know, you think, well, that's Peter on Jesus's right hand, the disciple Peter, who he had launched the church and whatnot and everything. But the conspiracy theorists say, well, that's a little feminine looking for a, a man, for a disciple. And, you know, but if you look at everybody, everyone is kind of infeminate too. But their, their talk is, their story and they're sticking to it is that's a woman and that's Jesus's wife. That's Mary Magdalene. So they just keep on taking this even deeper, right? Not just that he's married, but he's married to Mary Magdalene, who, of course, is portrayed as a prostitute. And they, of course, the book goes on to say, well, they've only said she's a prostitute because they want to discredit her as Jesus is why, blah, 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 blah. And the other thing they say is, if you look at how this person and Jesus form the, uh, the V, and the V is a symbol of the chalice, and the chalice is a symbol of women from way back to pagan times, whereas Conversely, the upside down V, the chevron, is the symbol for male. They say, well, that's a chalice. That's just telling us that that's a woman. So, so the, the controversy is right there. Is this a disciple or is this Jesus' wife? And it doesn't really matter one way or the other. This was just to show that this term... Scotomization is the psychological tendency for people to see what they want to see, not see what they don't want to see in situations, in themselves, in anything, even in a painting, due to the psychological impact that seeing it or not seeing it would inflict. So it's not even an optical illusion. People are going to look at things with their own filter. They're going to look at it with their lens and their background, and they're going to come up with this kind of stuff. Now, when I was the secretary of my lodge, which was actually a pretty fun 15 years, I kind of enjoyed it, but it was long enough. It was time to pass it on. But we were lucky to have, of course, dad come to the meetings to support us. And if you don't know my dad, he's Walter McDougall. He's on the screen here somewhere. He'd always give us some words of wisdom from his, uh, his past or his, his readings, his thoughts. And one day he got up and he said, you know, brethren, we are all blocks of marble and we hold the chisel and we can make ourselves into whatever we want. And he said, are you going to be a moral person or a ruffian? Well, he really said, are you going to be a master mason or a ruffian? But when you do this and you have people that aren't masons, it, they can't really relate to, are you going to become a master mason? And they think you're saying they're going to become a ruffian because it's a woman and they can't become a master mason. So I change it to a moral person or a ruffian. And I really like that analogy so much that I use it in this presentation and it's not just because, you know, you have the choice of making yourself anything you want to be. I want to point out, you're not the only hand on that chisel. There's a lot of people in the world that want to make you into what they want you to be. They want you to think that it's really cool to drink a lot of beer on the weekends and have kind of like the beer commercial lifestyle. So that's how they market their product. 
they're trying to influence you or they might influence you to do other things. The point is you're not the only influence or you're not the only hand on that chisel that's forming you unless you keep a close, close watch on what's going on. Now here's another case study, and I think this one's gonna be a little better the way I worked it out to do for us. So here's Linda. So imagine a woman who's uh, 31 years old, you know, and you can read through that as well as I can read it to you. She has all these attributes, and it says, please rank the following statements in order of their probability of being true, where one is the most probable, and you know, eight would be the least probable. So I'm gonna say, even though it's not true, this is the results from one of my past classes with Dawn. And this is an answer that someone turned in. How do those answers look to anybody here? See anything funny about that? Or did this person nail it right on? I, I'm trying to find out what what information we were given that would would guide us uh this that she was a bank teller right yeah yeah now that's a good point because i when i did that when i when i did it i i thought where the heck where the heck did bank teller come from but okay good point excellent now let's look at it as it doesn't matter what it says about linda does anyone see something funny about just the way those answers are? Not looking at the description of Linda. Bank teller shows up frequently. Yeah, no, that's true. Okay, okay, number one says Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. And number two, it says Linda is active in the feminist movement. Now we order, what was the directions? To list it in order of the most probable. Is it more probable that she can do two things than it is that she can do one thing when that one thing is included in the two things? No, so that, that is highly impossible statistically. It's like saying, I can walk across the floor and then fall down. And that's more probable than me just walking across the floor. The probability of two things happen is twice as um, unlikely as it is for one thing to happen. But it'll be amazing how many times we do this presentation that somebody will pick you is a bank teller and feminist as number one or the other one where it um, takes, works in a bookstore and takes yoga classes. They'll pick that as number one because, hey, there's a lot of information in that. Let's go with that's probably, that's gotta be the right answer. But it comes down to randomness and it comes down to uh, statistics. What's the most probable thing? That's where a lot of the uh, answers are really coming from. So when in doubt, what are the odds? So it comes down to probability. Oh my God, so after 10 already. So here's just a quick little practicality thing on probability. Everyone knows if you toss a coin, what are the chances that you're gonna get heads? 50%, right? Because there's two chances, you can get heads or you can get tails. So it's one out of two, it's 50%. You know, if you toss that coin for a hundred times and you get heads, what are the chances that when you toss it for 101 time that you're gonna get heads again? Has it gotten a lot slimmer just because you've done it a lot of time? No, the coin has not intrinsically changed. That's right. So when you flip it, it's, unless that coin's weighted for heads, which doesn't come into statistics, it's gonna be 50-50. So if you have a little bit different, if you have two children, what are the odds that one is a boy? Well, the possibilities is you can have a girl and then you can have a boy. You can have a boy and then you can have a girl, which is different. It's two different things here. Or you can have two boys and you can have two girls. 
So the odds that you have one boy is going to be three fourths or 75%. The odds that you have two boys is going to be uh, one out of four or 25%. And so that just runs you through the, uh, the different probabilities that you can do. Um, so that's just a quick little study on how important statistics can be. Uh, critical thinking, this is a great cartoon. The second option feels right, let's go with that. It feels right, it's my gut thinking. And should we always ignore what the data says? This is the engineer, that's why this is here. Should we always ignore what the data says or is this more of a one-time thing? Don't you like bosses like that? And then you get to really drive the knife in there and the boss comes back because you know it's called intuition. Well, that's a slippery slope to witchcraft. And that, that emotional, that gut thought, it's wrong most of the time and the tricky thing about gut thoughts, it doesn't matter how smart you are and how much you know about the subject. Most of the time, gut thinking is wrong. And, you know, my cousin was a uh, lawyer. He grew, he, he went to school in the 60s, you know, he didn't wear shoes to school and stuff. But when he got out, you know, he wore the three piece suits and I don't know if he wore shoes again, but he, he was a lawyer. And smart, smart guy, got tired of being a lawyer. So he went back to school to become a doctor. And uh, when he got through being, when he got through school, I remember him telling my dad, you know, it's not like what you think. What they do is they give you all these lists. And what you do is you start down the list. And when the answer takes you over here, you start down that list. And that brings you to what the symptoms bring you over to what is actually wrong with the patient. So there's not a lot of this thinking, it's all spelled out for you. And I think what that's doing is it's so easy to have a gut thought based on what you think that they were making wrong diagnosis. So they have all these things to lead them down, make them think of everything before they get to the solution. If it's not true, well, that's too bad. It makes a perfect example to use in this case. So I'm gonna keep doing that. All right, and like what we said, part of uh, critical thinking is logic. And we have our books that give logic puzzles. So Don's gonna do quite a bit on this. So I'm just gonna give you a, a short time to look at this first one. If you can't get it immediately, you won't get it at all because it takes me about four or five times of looking at it before I remember the trick to it. Can anyone throw out the answer to, uh, to this first one if, of the lily pads? Let me see. 49 years. Exactly, exactly. Because 41 year ago, the first lily pad was half the size of the pond. So if you had two lily pads, you've now covered the pond. So of course, everyone's gonna say two lily pads, 50 divided by two, 25 years. But, so that's perfect. And that's an example of you know, how logic comes into that. It's not just a brain teaser, it's a logical thought. And that brings me to the end of my slideshow. And I've used up Don's time. So I'm gonna turn it right back over to him. Any questions while Don's bringing up his uh, his slides, and I'll warn you, I took everything I knew and I put it into my slides. So <laughs> questions might lead to more uh, research. I'd like to just quickly comment that, uh, especially with the optical illusions, it's the context that is so important in what you see. And that's also so important in the information you gather. Make sure you understand the context. Yeah, great point. Thank you, Hans. Okay, do we want to take a short break, five minutes, to before we do this, or do we want to start right in? Keep her going. Okay. Work off the momentum. All right. right. So, well, 
we'll we'll go we can go through this in in 45 what i've got here i'm quite sure we'll we'll stop at 11 anyway the first thing i've got are just a list of some of the common criti critical thinking fallacies that we run into and the arguments and of course some of our uh, occupations their job the job is to introduce critical thinking fallacies within their audience uh, salespeople politicians attorneys in the court situa situation they're trying each person is trying to con either that person is guilty or convince them that person is innocent and it can't be both so one of them is going to have to be working to try to introduce critical thinking fallacies within the jury anyway so this the one of the basic uh, uh critical fallacy we're into the what someone says is not discussed you just attack the man who said it and so and especially in politics this goes again on uh, and i'm going to go quickly down through these uh appeal to ignorance so like this one if uh, you know you you establish a claim because there's no evidence against it so therefore you know we don't have any evidence against unicorns so we don't have to say well it must be unicorns then uh pity you know well they need it that student needs the grade that sort of thing uh advertising oh everybody else is doing it. you should do this too and this is the one that i like a uh, begging question this and this last quote is from Walter's father, uh, George's father, Walter. In other words, you beg the question, politicians say, well, we've got to do what's best for the company, country, and then we have to have common sense solutions. Well, that's assuming that their solution is the best and so forth. And the one that uh, Walter gave us happened in Bangor. A woman said, if the King James Version is good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for me. Well, you know, the King James Version was written, what, 1,500 years afterwards. But anyway, this is what people do. They, we see, oh, he's begging the question. And this is the sort of thing that's happening. Uh, loading question, you know, if we do this one, you know, if you stop beating your wife, you know, that sort of thing. And then we assume, well, we have some good people in a company, so therefore it must be a great company. Or there are some nice people in that family. It must be a great family. Or um, I got to get out my quick notes here. This equivocation example of that. For some reason, when I, when I copied this over, it didn't go there. Okay. The example they gave for equivocation Sure, philosophy helps us, helps you argue better, but do we need to really need to encourage people to argue? So they've changed this, changed the argument around completely. I'm just quickly skipping through these. And this this is one we tend to often consider either a person is a friend or in between ground. And then George ran into this one, the gambler's fallacy, where if we toss a coin 50 times and it's all heads, well, the next time we're probably thinking should be tails times tails come out. Uh, the genetic fallacy that we run into is, well, his father was no good, he's no good, that sort of thing. Or his father's a wonderful person, therefore he should be a wonderful person. And then this term, of course, we put Latin ter terms on these things and it makes it sound better. And this is, uh, this, this just is a bad argument. This is one that we run about after this, this post hoc era. We had a neighbor, a uh, lady, Aunt Kate, and she hated nice days, sunny, shiny days in the wintertime because you go, nothing but a weather breather. So she thought that that nice weather brought on that next storm that was coming on. Another term we hear is this red herring, and that comes from the idea of the, uh, the red herring were smoked heron. And in English fox hunting, when they were training hounds to see if they could draw the hound off the scent, they would uh, drag a red herring across the trail where the fox or whatever was going. And so that 
uh, red herring ideas, something from old, from training clock sounds, actually, where we're trying to do something, we say something irrelevant to draw, draw people away from the argument or from the path they were taking. And, whoops. Well, we, I see we got something there. Oh, something skipped on this slide. Well, uh, we missed something. Uh, straw man, that's where you claim someone, and we use this a lot in social media, especially that we put ism, he's a ick or phobic or whatever on the end of somebody, we, we define them that way. And then the other thing we do to introduce critical thinking here is, is we suppress the evidence. We just don't tell the whole story. So that's just some quick ideas we run to, some problems we run into when fallacies and critical thinking and nothing we need to memorize, I don't think. And the slippery slope, I think you referenced this too, George, where if you start this, well then, you know, so we get the arguments. If we start there, then we're, we're gonna wind up somewhere else. And so uh, one example they gave was government should not pro prohibit drugs Otherwise, they also begin to ban alcohol with cigarettes, then fatty food, junk food, and have to be regulated. Next thing you know, wants us to force to buy nothing larger than 12 ounce soft drinks. So again, this is, doesn't mean just because we're, we oppose drugs or something like that, that we're gonna wind up banning uh, 16 ounce bottles. So. Okay, and then you, well, we skipped somewhere there. Anyway, ignore that, I'm hoping. This is where we kind of start. And we start with what we learn. And this, we, most all of us have seen these sorts of diagrams. We remember 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see and hear, 50% of what and so forth, 50% uh, of what they see and hear. And then we get down here, uh, what we do, what we say and write, and we remember 90% of what we do. And this brings me, for us anyway, as Masons, this idea, the habit of people are not learning the lectures within the lodges. We are starting to have specialists within our districts. Well, so-and-so does this lecture, does the first lecture for Master Mason and so forth. So what we're doing by having one person do a perhaps better lecture, you know, a more professional lecture, we're winding up denying the other people in our lodge to get the chance to learn what these lectures are talking about by actually trying to do the lectures. So this is, I threw this up here, one problem where I think we're running into with lodges in not having everybody, you know, is the officers go through the chairs, learn the lectures that go with it. That's enough for that soapbox. Okay, now what we're working with with our critical thinking is this brain of ours. Now our brain, is made up of, it's not just one solid mass. It's got two sides, the left and right hemispheres, and it's got all these different parts of it. And we're not born with our brains hardwired for these different areas to talk to each other. And so what we've got to do is we've got to train ourselves. We've got to undergo critical thinking. We've got to train ourselves how to get, train our brain and get it to form uh, connections within the brain that will allow it to communicate and work with itself. Um, let's see. All right. And then this, the thing that does connect the whole, um, well, I guess I'll introduce it here. Okay. The idea that, uh, our brain is not hardwired and connected to each other. Our uh, left, the left hemisphere controls the right side of our body. Our right hemisphere controls the left side of our body. So our left hand is controlled by the right side, the right hand is controlled by the left side. So just a quick little demonstration to do this, and I'd like to have everybody try it if they would. Uh, would you just try tapping your left hand twice while you tap your right hand three times? So you go one, two, three. Everybody just try that for yourself. And so we can go one, two, three. That's okay. That's something we can do without too much work. But now would you try tapping your left hand four times, your right hand five times? One. Whoop, wait a minute. One. I think I got him in there. 
Now, I used to drum. And so many times we you were know, trying to make your two hands work in concert with each other. And you had to do something to get you, you. It wasn't that easy to make your two hands work in opposite beats. And so what we would do, we would often put that into language because language then, and that comes up later how our language is controlled, but language connects various parts of our brain. So if I go uh, like that, A, just a little bit more, I can get the four and five. So if I go A, just a little bit more, I've got my left hand four times, my right hand five times in the same amount of time. So um, now going down to that, what connects the, our brain together is this uh, cerebral cortex, the gray matter that goes always about the size of the internet and it goes on top of the brain. And that, if we get down here, that is the seat of our motor function, our social abilities, our language, and our problem solving. So what we're doing is we're trying to form neurons within that, that connect all these different parts of our brain. And you do that, apparently we can do that by doing brain teasers, uh, riddles, that sort of things. Um, let me go ahead. And that's just kind of a diagram showing that's folded and gives a lot of area in it. We can form lots of cells in there. And then the corpus callosum helps the two sides of the brain uh, two hemispheres could talk to each other, connect them. And let's see. And then we know that our brains are all different. Uh, when we're teenagers, we do take a lot of risks because our brains rewire during our teen years. They start sometime when we're 14. And for some of we guys, that doesn't stop until we're about 30. We finally get our brains rewired. Don, can I ask, can I ask a yeah. quick question? Yes. Um, what what in, in the brain itself breaks down over time? I mean, is it that that connective thing that's that's breaking down, or is it a, a bigger thing? You no, know, no, it it te it tends to be the uh, those neurons break down, and the connections they're no longer there to form them. Uh, okay, right here, I guess this is where how the brain makes memories. Every time we make a memory, a tiny filament reaches out from one neuron and forms an electro connect. You know, the, electrochemical connection to a neighboring one. In other words, these neurons form connecting the, these filaments form connecting the two neurons. So those filaments break down in the dementia. And so what we can do from what the uh, uh, research, neural research, of course, this is all since the year 2000, we've had terrific in uh, research in the brain function. But apparently, what we can do with people with to offset dementia and slow it down anyway is keep people working keeping the brain active making it forcing it to form new neurons and also form new connections and also going back to parts of their brain from when they were in their 30s music especially is a good one because music occupies or operates on many parts of the brain not just one part you know and doesn't have to be processed so one other quick question, Brian. Brian had posted this in chat, which is interesting. Is um, the uh, statistic that we only use ten percent of our brains? Uh, is that you know is that true? No, that's some of that pop popular misconceptions. We may be any one task might be only using ten percent of our brain, but our full brain is functioning all the time, and it's and it's up to us to use it. And you know to get it so they can function with each other, you know. But no, that's that's one of those myths, urban legend, you know, like the idea of the sugar high, you know, that's, that's usually comes about because you have an exciting time, you know. Anyway, we've got quite a few of those. Um, other questions, other, where I just skipped right through that whole bunch of stuff. Um, okay. Our working memory. For most of us, this is limited may around seven items. Uh, some people uh, might have up to 10. Now, the working memory, that's when I'm where Ann asked me to put up a cup hook out here. I want some cup hooks out in our kitchen. And so we 
go along and say, well, let's put a piece of wood in there so we can screw the cup hooks into it. And so I go along and I measure it and I go, it's seven three eighths by seven three eighths by seven three eighths. I get out of the table saw and we measure out 53 and seven eighths, 53 and seven eighths. And this is something we have to do. And this is hard why we, when we're trying to train someone else to do a job or do a task, we impose more than seven or 10 items on their brain and it can't handle it as a working memory. They've got to put that into their reflex actions part of it. And often this happens, we just overwhelm someone try to train them in a new task. Anyway, so if I get you to uh, do this, uh, just a little demonstration. Everybody knows the days of the week. We can say them to ourselves very quickly, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's pretty much, do, we can do that. Uh, how about, so would you say the words, uh, the days of the week backwards? And then we can do that. It's Sunday, Saturday, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. I can do that. Now, we're going to overload the brain. We just say the days of the week alphabetically. What's the first day of the week alphabetically? Someone to pop up with something. I think most of us, or at least I would, I tend to go with Monday, but I forget about Friday. And so, oh, that's right. So what I've got to do here is I've got to remember the names of the days of the week, how they're spelled, where that letter, those letters come within their alphabet, in what order. And that's just more things that my brain can handle at one time, you know, in processing tasks. And you can do a number of things like this. You can say the, uh, the days of the year, say the days of the, I mean, not the days of the year, the months of the year, say that alphabetically. And that's one that's fun to do. Just to toss out at someone. If we have to do the, uh, for me, I tend not to start with April. I tend to start my birthday month, my birth month, August. So I start with that and I say, whoops, that's right. AU comes after AP, so April, August, and then I've got to stop and think, uh, we've got a D in there, right? December, and we got February, and it comes quite a lot slower for I can remember how the, the, night, the months, how they're spelled, where that's going to come in my alphabet. So I don't know how far did I get. I get April, August, December, February. What comes after February? Uh, anything in there? How about we get that June, July, January mess? July, so June. January. Yeah. Yes. Yep. January would be first. So that's, yes. That's Boy, what we got. Yeah. And then we've got, well, wherever, you know, we meet up the Jews, the Junes, uh, J, uh, where are we next? What's the next one we got up with? October? March. Pardon me? March and May. How about November? We got November for. I don't know where we are now, actually, but this is just March, something. March, May, November. Yes. Yeah. No, November, October. Oops. And December, finally. I mean, in December, September, finally. Yeah. Anyway, these are sorts of things that very quick demonstration. Our working memory is not very long. And you can imagine when you're trying to teach, they're trying to teach somebody to operate an excavator. That excavator's got a, a boom out there, it goes up and down, it can pull in a crowd, you know, it can turn back and forth, it can move. You've got all these different things to try to control at one time. And they way exceed our working memory. And most of us want to depend on about seven, that's it. We don't want to try carrying that at one time. Okay, oh, there, here we go. Attention. How many Fs we got in this thing? Somebody give me a number? <laughs> what do we got? We got six Fs in there, and anybody know? Okay, I there's one there. Three. One, two. The Rs, we tend not to have the Rs in there. One, oh. two, three, four, five. Six, I believe. Is that yeah, right? That's right. Okay. And the reason for that is, whoops, sorry about that. I thought we had uh, an explanation for that. 
Anyway, this is because of the reason why it's harder for us to see this. We tend not to see the actual spelling of these words. And so all we don't see that, those Fs and those things. And doesn't show up as much for me anyway, as it does the F in the scientific. All right, here's another one. Here's where you give them some information. You know, your mother's sister married an only child. All right, <clears throat> that means the, those cousins of your mother's sister, those, those are your cousins, don't have any cousins on the other side, on their father's side, because she married an only child, okay? Now we get down to the riddle. Now this is where we, we build and improve our, th our critical thinking skills. And they, we have these activities for anywhere from um, preschool, I believe, right straight up through. We've got all kinds of uh, for young people, for older, and supposedly this will help uh, help reduce or delay the onset of the dementia and those things breaking down. So, who's your mother's only sister's sons, brothers, aunts, daughters, sisters, father? Okay, so Luke, you got an answer? Is it my dad? Yes. Okay. Could be a second. Just too many sons, brothers, sisters, and so forth for us to be able to use our working memory to figure out. So your mother's only sister's son, okay. This only sister, her son, his brother is, his, you know, he has son's brothers. So his brother, his brother's aunt is your mother. Her daughter's sister is your father. So. It's these sorts of things that just demonstrate how very limited our abilities are to handle the relatively simple project, but just too many words in there for us to handle. Okay, um, this one, this is purported to be a measure of our uh, intelligence level. And so apparently I've heard that it was used in China to determine who had an IQ above 120 and who didn't. So within this, the question is, how many different triangles can you come up with? And 18 being the boundary, where at, if you can find 18 different triangles, then you have an IQ of about 120. I can find, so far, I've been able to find 25 different triangles here. So what we do is, number one is a triangle, number two is a triangle, number three is a triangle. Well, one and two are a triangle. Two and three are a triangle. One, two, and three are triangles. So why don't we take just oh, a short time here and see how many how many triangles we can come up with. So let's stop for say a um, couple of minutes, maybe at the most. Minute we'll start with. Go ahead. See how many different triangles you can come up with. Okay, about and a half of those. So how many total did we come up with? Anybody? Luke, how many did you get? 23. But I you got 23, count. okay. I'm almost positive I double counted somewhere. Is that right? Well, 
I wound up having to, you know, write this all down on a sheet of paper so I could tell what I had. All right, very quickly now, we can skip through this thing. So we, we only got about 20 minutes left. Okay, one, two, and three. We got one, two, three triangle, four triangles, five triangles, and the whole thing is a triangle. So we've got six triangles up here in that bit. <clears throat> All right, then we've got another, we can do six as a triangle, five and six as a triangle, four, five, and six, and so together. And then we go this way with that triangle. One, two, three, four, five, six is a triangle. And so one and four is a triangle, two and five, three and six. One, four, two, five, two, five, three, six, triangle. Um, then we go down here to a similar thing, seven, seven and eight, and seven, eight and nine. So um, I'm not sure how that we would, I would read to the stuff that I've got. But the one thing I, I found many times looking at this, I didn't find one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the entire triangle listed among these. So that's, again, I have no idea whether this is valid or not, because a lot of things come up that's not valid. We, we see online and social media and so forth. Mythol mythical. Okay. And this, uh, I've just got a bunch of different examples of these brain teasers, riddles, questions, and so forth. Uh, and again, these are ranged anywhere from adult to children so that we can actually work. At least I like doing brain teasers. These sort of, uh, apparently Sudoku is good at this too, keeps the brain functioning, at least with the numbers. So in other words, something like this, you had 17 buckets carry in, so 17 divides into 340, 20 times. And um, now this one, um, We've got, what's the next sequence in this? I, I tried not to memorize this, so I don't know what we've got. Two, eight. Okay, we've got a difference here of, of two, then four, then six, then eight, right? And then we go back to two again. Is this the next one, the sequence going to be uh, two, four, another 75, 38. Anybody got another thought? I'm guessing that, that that sequence starts over again. We've read to two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, but I don't know. All right. Um, is that a true statement? And for me, with this four seven one one four seven, that was that that measurement I talked about. I've got the same digits. Is that number less than this number? No, the one is smaller than the four, and so forth. This one would uh, would uh, improve hopefully our spatial abilities and our spatial manipulations. So. Somebody got an answer for how what we can do, how we can move three of these X's and flip this thing upside down? That one's easy from the artist viewpoint. Uh, top one just falls down and the two uh, side ones go up. Yes, yeah. So we, this one would drop down here, then this X would go over here, this one go over here and we'd flick it to four, three, two, and one that way. Right. Just don't don't ask no. me any more math questions, though. Forget that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that's the thing. These critical thinking activities, there's all kinds of this math, there's calculations, there's the logic puzzles. There's, you know, so there are all sorts of things within our brain teaser field to do that will hopefully improve our critical thinking abilities and keep our brain reasonably young and active. Okay. And here I have some trouble with trying to slide with the print big enough to see. Anyway, which types of animals can jump higher than a house? Well, of course, that depends on how we're reading that thing. Higher than a house is high or higher than a house can jump. You know? And then like this, before Mount Everest was discovered, what was the highest mountain on Earth? Well, if Mount Everest is the highest, well, it's 
was the highest end too before we discovered it. You know, these, and again, little play on language and interpretation and 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 deciphering what the question, what the sentence really says. And this one. And I've seen several variations of the same one. The thing is, we tend to, uh, as far as our logic goes, we tend to think that this adds up to a whole, one half, one third, and one ninth. And that those three fractions do not add up to a whole. The lowest common denominator of these things is going to be 18. So that's 9 18 6 18 and 2 18 9, 6, and 2 is 17. Okay, that's not that's 17 18. We're lacking one. But if you get to 17 18 here, you see we got 17 horses. Okay. So this other guy, whoever he was, the neighbor, brought one of his horses over. They divided, they took half of the 18 horses, nine of them, gave them one son. They took a third of them, six of them gave to another son. And they took one, two of them, one ninth of them to the youngest guy. And it adds up to 17 horses and the guy walks back with it, keeps his horse and goes back home. And this, this is a so-called Stroop test. And there's an explanation coming up just afterwards. Okay, so go through this. And, and read, you know, say the, say the color of the word. So this is red, that's white, green, brown, green, red, brown, white. Uh, that word is red. Now, so go ahead, try to say the color of the word, not the word. And for me, that gets pretty hard to do, especially where we start here with this word is brown. And I go to the next one, I'm starting to say green, but no, that's not it, that's red. Then that one's green, then this one is white. And these, you'll find these things online all over the place. And here's the explanation. It's uh, supposedly, it it's measures our attentional vitality and flexibility. We read words more quickly and then we can name colors. We, we don't have to think of, we have to think about what that color is or what the word, but we can just read the word. So therefore, when we, when we try to read those words, that word is white, but the color of the thing is written in is red. So it's just not something that's more processing has to take place. And so apparently this is supposed to measure our attentive abilities. Now, sometimes I, I wonder about some of the logic there and so forth. All right, and here's an article. This is a lot of our research is from really new. And this, the more curious we are about a talk, topic, the easier it is to learn information about that topic. And I think we, we all can think of when we were back in school, if we were curious or interested in the subject, it was much easier to learn than like for me, to learn French, that was that was most difficult for me to deal with French, and I did everything I could to have to take, to avoid taking any more language courses. I took a year of solid geometry and a year of English history to avoid, to fill my schedule up, so I didn't have to take some more years of French. Okay, that's just, and we we need to think about this sometimes if we're going to teach if we can in, encourage some kind of a curiosity within what we're doing, or we, we want to learn a task ourselves, if we can incur, encourage our own curiosity, then we can learn to do the task easier. Sometimes these these things, when we get some tra task we dread, if we would just perhaps stop dreading it so bad and take up something that we're curious about, we might learn it quicker, maybe. Okay, and another math problem. Um, you got to be at school at 8.15, you take 15 baths, 20 minutes to get dressed, 25 to eat, 15 minutes to ride his bike and so forth. And so we add up all these minutes. We've got here, we get an hour and a quarter. So we get 75 minutes. And so an hour and a quarter before 8.15 is seven, he's gonna to have to get up at seven in the morning. 
And these these things you get, we get books of them and so forth all the time. Here's now again, I think George alluded to this a little bit, what we see when we're looking at stuff. You see, we look here, we have a scene, and yet we also, our brain can pick out a, an outline of a baby in the thing. And I'm not sure that we have any particular explanation for it. That's just our brain sees patterns, you know. And then this one, here's one of these. Apparently, I can see the center one as a circle, uh, but I'm ha I cannot see concentric circles. And yet, uh, if I trace it with my fingers, these are all concentric circles. I've never happened to see this little optical illusion before. <laughs> This, this grouping stuff reminds me of that exercise where they'll uh, switch out symbols mm -hmm. or letters in a sentence, mm -hmm. and, yet you, and yet you're still able to, because of the grouping and the context of those letters, read it, even though it's not actually written out in true characters. Yeah, yeah. Brain really is a, a very marvelous uh, organ. And we need to take as best care as we can, but it does. I, but it does need to be trained too. While we're at it, it just isn't going to happen automatically. But yeah, I, I really, I can the the center one I can see is a circle, and I sort of can trace out these other, but I cannot make that picture appear to me to be uh, what four concentric circles. And I've tried, you know, you stare them long enough, try to make them work. And then this is just an example. This is one for younger children to learn their alphabet. So they can, this a maze and they can take through the little cricket or something that goes up in one side and comes out the other side is, you know, a grasshopper or some darn thing. So they, they're all age groups. And then we get these number patterns. We can go here uh, and it's, depending on the difficulty of them, we can be uh, it can be used as arithmetic training things for young children, counting by numbers, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, so forth. Um, something like this. Um, I look at this, this is a little hard, at least for me, harder to do because it's uh, 56, 55, 54, 3, 2, 1. Okay, so we're starting up here at 58, I guess, and counting down. This one, we would start at... Uh, Four, four, 16, okay, this at four. So it'll be 24, 28, 32. Anyway, they have, there are all kinds of these around people working. This one, I'm not sure. I, of course I copied these and I forgot what the answer was when I saw them. Any idea what we got for a number? We've got 10, this one, and then two, and then there's four, and then there's six. Uh, any wild idea? Is that going to be eight or what? I have no idea what the next number is for sure for the answer. This one's tough because we don't have a repeating pattern yet. Right. We, there's nothing to tell us whether we're going to continue with this uh, 10 and 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. You know, is that what we're going to do? We're going to go to... Um, I have no idea. Some of them like this, I'm not sure they are. It's it's ambiguous for us what the sequence is going to be. Yeah, I'm guessing that the, it's two, four, six, eight, ten, and we just started with the last number and got three of them in there. Yeah. Okay. So it's uh, 10, 2, 4, 6, 8, okay. 10, 2, 4, 6. Okay, could could be. Yeah. So you think sixty one would be the next number? I think if, if sixty one was the next number, then we would have a pattern. But we don't have that number right. eight is, is is not a given yet. You know, because it right. could be it could be ten two four six ten two four six. We don't have enough of a pattern yet. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. That's the last example I've got. I'm, I've just got a final thing. Now we see a lot of stuff on the. Um, on the internet and we see these and we tend to believe what we're looking at and i i there's a whole page or so that i found with this and i was kind of get suckered into it okay so test the germ and a stress level 
and we're going to have an image down there and so forth. Okay. And they're saying this was a very, sounds very good. St. Mary's Hospital, look at both dolphins jumping out of the water. Dolphins are essentially identical. Closely monitored scientific study revealed that in spite of the fact that the dolphins are so similar, a person under stress would find many differences between the two. And so it sounds like it's an official study. I'm thinking, well, that's pretty good. The more differences a person finds between the dolphins, the more stress that person is experiencing. And so we're thinking, wow, I'm not, that's kind of interesting. And then the picture that came up is that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I was completely taken aback by it. <laughs> I, I, they had me going, and I thought, wow, this is ready. I want to check. And so I could see you know, a steer jumping beside a dolphin. Anyway, that I just thought I'd throw that in there because we really need to be careful what we get sucked into reading it online. Uh, the, do the documentation of the validity of that is kind of limited. Anyway, that's it. I'm finished. We've got what, maybe two or three minutes, four or five minutes left before 11. So George, you want to wrap up? Do you, are we, who is going to wrap up here? Yeah, you know, I think this is a great ending here because stress actually really shuts down critical thinking. If you ever notice when you're really angry, when you're really uh, put on the spot, you just can't think. It's, it shuts down the brain. So that's a great ending. I'll give you another thing here that you can use to win free beers at a bar that goes kind of with the Stroop test. So if I can remember how it goes, um, what we're going to do is I'm going to, uh, we're going to say the word white three times, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. So you don't have to turn on your uh, <clears throat> mic. You can do this, you know, just to yourself. So let's go, you know, white, white white now what color is the border of this slide it's white what do cows drink now how many people said water and how many people said milk right because your brain's thinking white cows what's got what's a white cows got to do with anything it's milk so that, that goes over really well if you're sitting up at a bar and start talking to people around you but uh, any, any questions any comments questions you guys want to share with us i've just got one comment going back to the logical fallacies um of the straw man one thing that may be of interest for our uh our students to think about is the iron man argument which is the opposite of the straw man uh, Thomas Aquinas, in, uh, as he lays out his, his arguments, um, actually goes for an Iron Man argument where he tries to um, uh, propose his opponent's argument in the strongest way possible before attacking it. Uh, and and that's, uh, it's a pretty powerful way of rhetoric if you try to uh, make the strongest case for your opponent and then logically take it down. So. If anyone's interested in that, um, uh, Thomas Aquinas is uh, a good person to take a gander at. Very good. Thank you. That's a good one. All right. I'm writing that down right now. So everybody have a great rest of your weekend. Uh, be safe and keep it on the level. Great. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Great. Thank, Thank you, everybody. So Thank long. Thank you.